massively appreciate it. No, no problem at all, and, and thanks for having me, Tracy. Um, so yeah, just as Tracy mentioned, I'm gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about how we transition to a remote first culture. Uh, we're a little bit different to maybe some of the companies you've you've heard from before, in that we have a little bit of a hybrid between co-located offices and and remote teams. So as Tracy said, I'm I'm the co-founder and chief product officer here at Glowfox. Um, so quick. Quick intro then in terms of the company. So we were set up back in 2014. Uh, effectively, we're, we're a SaaS product, so we're a subscription business for the fitness industry. So our customers are gyms, typically, you know, small boutique gyms or large chains. So we provide the software and tools for them to run their business end to the, end to end. So effectively, the, the operating system for the fitness industry. As Tracy said, we're VC backed, so we've raised about 23 million over the last number of years. Uh, we have 100 plus people on the team. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's a slightly different model. And we have this hybrid remote model in that some of our, our folks are, are out of the office and some are co-located in a number of our locations. So I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, the interesting thing is that the fact that we're in fitness and, and obviously COVID is, is impacting um, all industries, but in, in particular fitness is, is had, to, had to make a similar shift in term, terms of going remote as well. So interesting times for, for us as a, as a company that we've had to slightly pivot and adapt our product to, to the needs of our industry. So in terms of the objective of this session, so I'm gonna go through some of the, you know, the challenges that we, we faced on our journey of going remote. Um, and particularly in that, you know, the hybrid model, which is what we're in today. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper on communication um, and some of the learnings on onboarding and performance management. I'll probably pause for questions at the communication piece uh, and time permitting, we can, we can keep going on performance management um, and then kind of wrap up with, with what's next for us on our journey. So yeah, so in terms of how we started off and as I mentioned, we, we you know, started the company back in 2014. You know, I'd love to be able to say that, you know, this was, you know, we had the foresight to know that the future of work was going to be remote and we started this from, from the get-go. Um, but, you know, this was purely accidental. So we had a, a relatively small team of maybe 10 or, or 15 folks in, in an office or in a basement in, in Ranla. We had a number of engineers and we were kind of struggling to, to get and, and grow our, our engineering team. Um, you know, we're competing with the likes of, of Google and, and, and Facebook, for instance. Um, so, you know, we asked the, the team whether they had anyone in their network um, that, they, you know, that they could introduce us to, to, you know, to, to join the engineering team. Uh, and it turns out one of the guys had a, a friend of his was based in Venezuela, um, but he had a challenge that he couldn't relocate. So we, we took a punt and, and effectively, you know, tried out the remote thing. I've had one engineer that wasn't sitting in the office with the, the rest of the team. And then over time, we, you know, we proved it out that this was a really effective way for us to get the best talent. Um, so, the, you know, this was the, the main driver was really about, you know, it was a bit of a talent war in, in Dublin, as we know, particularly in, in engineering at the time. Um, so this was, this was whole, our whole decision was, was finding, you know, getting the, the right talent regardless of, of, you know, location. Um, you know, cost is one thing, but it, for us, it's, it's, it's definitely about getting, getting the, the right people and, and being able to scale a, a company. You know, it's 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 been able to, you know, it's given us that opportunity to, to scale, you know, quickly and, and efficiently as well. And as I mentioned, you know, we have slightly different model in that we have a number of offices as well. So our main hub is Dublin. We have an office in LA and we have an office in Sydney. Um, we've just opened up another little hub in Minneapolis, but we've got you know smaller offices in Galway, Cork, and Belfast as well, and then a smaller little hub in, in Chennai too, and then we've got remote. So remote makes up about 40% 40, 40 of, of our team. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, the challenges that we've had, you know, trying to grow the team across different offices plus the remote. Um, obviously, we're in the, the COVID world right now where everybody's remote. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still early days for us on this remote journey. You know, we're, you know, we're five or six years and we're by no means experts. We've learned a lot of lessons along the way. We've made plenty of mistakes. So, uh, I'm going to share some of these these challenges and learnings. Um, so, you know, one of the main challenges that we're we're having in this hybrid model is for the team, the remote team sometimes felt you know isolated and sometimes could be 
you know, effectively feel like second class citizens. So to give you an example, we may have, a, you know, we may have a meeting of 10 people. Nine of those will be based in the Dublin office, one person outside the room. And, you know, the, the person outside the room didn't have the full context on, on the meeting happening. Maybe they for, we forgot to send a Zoom link. Um, you know, maybe the technology in the room wasn't working so well. Um, and they, you know, they felt that there were, you know, there were missing communications. Even meetings became a little bit more disruptive. Um, you know, the, the technology wouldn't work at the start of the meeting and, and people couldn't hear who was in the room and who was speaking and they were missing those uh, social cues as well. Um, potentially, you know, breakdowns in communication. Everyone in the co-located office obviously sharing um, an office in Dublin. It's easier to, you know, grab someone for 15 minutes and have a conversation and not share that information with the rest of the team. So, you know, there was a lot of, you know, miscommunication and missing context. Um, another point really was a bit of a challenge is that those remote folks lack that visibility and, and profile. So there may be instances where people may have, you know, felt like they were overlooked for promotion because they were not as visible as, as the folks in, in Dublin. Um, and then just in general, the, the onboarding processes were, were mainly geared towards the on-site joiners as opposed to the remote people. So we're, we were pretty much at a, at a juncture where, you know, we knew that there was huge benefits in the remote, but, it, you know, it wasn't really optimized the way we were working. So we had to kind of make a pretty big decision on, on what we're going to do to, you know, to, to make, make things work. And um, what we did was basically shift the whole company um, to, to basically mean that everybody was remote. So this whole remote first culture. And what I mean by that is, you know, every single, every single meeting. Um, so we had that meeting of 10 people, regardless of nine of those were, were sitting next to each other, we'd have to, you know, mandate that everybody would patch in on, on their, their laptop. And that, you know, those small subtle changes and that we kind of leveled it off that the remote people on a level playing field um, made a made a big difference and I'm going to talk about some some other examples of what we did to, on that journey but that's you know that's just a small change but it was a fundamental massive culture change for us to kind of assume that you know there isn't a, a Dublin hope that everybody is is remote so yeah so here's you know some of the you know some of the lessons learned in particular around communication as well so one one big one and it's a bit of a bugbear for for me in particular is, is slack so chat tools are great um you know slack and, and teams are are great for synchronous you know live communication um but we've seen and, and we've learned over over the last number of years that it's not you know it's not the form for decisions it's not the form to record actions or any detail on on any particular items um it's a, a very good way for you know instantaneous communication and um, but it's not that system of record so what i mean by system of record is not you know we don't record any you know key decisions any policies any you know any key updates are not going to live in in the slack world because things things get lost um it's very hard to follow threads and there's a lot of noise um so you know there's a lot of value in slack but we've we put things in in notion which is just another you know it's a wiki tool and i'll maybe give you a snapshot of, of how we use it um but that you know and, and making sure that kind of shift to asynchronous communication is is pretty big as well so there's an expectation that you know in the remote world that okay, if i don't respond to this particular message um you know my boss is going to think i'm you know i'm not at my desk or i'm not working so we you know we try and keep people to you know to carve out particular times of the day and, and just blast uh, responses in at one time because otherwise you're not going to get you know you're not going to get into deep work if you're you know stuck on slack all day thinking you're busy responding to messages um, but that's def that's a big big change for us as well as just to not rely on Slack for for everything and just you know create that system of record elsewhere. So over communication, you know, is you know it's obviously critical in in a co-located environment to to communicate. But in you know in a remote working world, it's just key to keep hammering your your message. And it might feel repetitive, but that is you know pretty significant in terms of getting comms out there to the right channels, the right people regularly and, and updates that people are all aligned. Um, and I think, you know, I, I mentioned the, the asynchronous piece being pretty key, but the one big learning, I think, for people that are, are making that shift from a co-located is, is the written comms. Um, so yeah, that, you know, everything needs to be written down, concise, clear, um, 
and documented and, and as i said in, in notion is what we use for kind of key updates as well in the remote world you know we need to be obviously super explicit you can't make assumptions on people understand uh, and are aligned to, to your message so you need to be super clear and and face-to-face -face video calls are 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 pretty key as well um you know so in one example again on slack as well people tend to get into an over and back over two or three messages best thing to do is just jump on a you know a face-to-face -face video call and and you know something could be wrapped up in in five minutes on a quick call um so that you know it does you know, we have a mandate and I'll talk to you through some of our, um, you know, ground rules on how we, we run meetings, but everyone needs to have their, their video calls on. It just, it, you know, gives people a lot more accountability. They're a lot more present. Um, they're more likely to contribute and they're more likely to collaborate once the, the video is there. And you, you miss those social cues once you, you know, you have the camera off and people are a lot more present. So in terms of, you know specifics on on how we work um you know we have you know multiple ways of of you know processes and pro, uh, protocols on how we do communication today we we do two all hands a week so we have one on tuesday and a friday and this is the whole business are involved um and this is you know making sure that everyone's aligned and uh, we did increase the, the cadence to that from twice a week to once a week and then that has made a, a big difference in proving that those comms, given that everybody's remote. Um, daily stand-ups within the teams, people started the day are obviously giving updates what their plan for the day is. One-to-ones, I'm going to talk a little bit more about one-to-ones and how we, um, we run those more often now in the, in the remote world. Regular updates around training, you know, lunch and learns, brown bags, retros, you know, Friday win session on, um, and, and product demos back to the business. Um, and weekly updates. So this is this is a new a new thing we kind of introduced in the last month or so. So we're using another tool called Lattice, which enables you know every individual at the end of the week to kind of give it a key update on what they you know what they achieved in that week, what the plan was for the next week, and then any blockers for their manager to to help with, and then kind of get a gauge on on sentiment too, on, on where you know how they're feeling as well. Um, and that has worked quite well um, because it enables the the manager to kind of have an asynchronous uh, response to you know if they have any questions they can write comments on that and come back uh, and just making sure everyone's aligned and then gives management line of sight to make sure that everyone is is lined up in terms of their focus for the following week. Um, and ground rules are are pretty important as well. So I'm going to touch on a couple of some of these examples of of what we established to. Um, you know, to make sure that we we communicate effectively. So, focus is is a big one, right? And I've I've talked about Slack and um, being a bit of a productivity killer. Um, but that whole context switching. So if you switch between tasks, you know, uh, there's a study here, I think from Basecamp. You know, on average, you, you lose 25 minutes. Um, so we've we've kind of introduced some. These are just some of the ground rules, but you know, to help people kind of behave like they would in in a working environment in in a co-located office. Um, so, you know, respect is, is a basic one about ensuring people turn up on time, ensure that when you're scheduling the, the meeting, you're mindful of, of time zones, given that we're, we're across multiple time zones and a key one there I've, I've spoken about being, being present, um, you know, and having, ca you know, videos on and for any particular meetings, uh, it's, it's important that people are not multitasking and that they're very much present in the meeting. I've seen, and we've had issues before where people are, you know, on Slack and, responding to emails at the same time as a as a meeting and, and they're not getting the you know you're not getting the, the full value from the participants when when uh, people are multitasking and then just you know basic logistics and this isn't obviously just specific to, to remote but it does it does help with with our structure in that you know every meeting is capped at 30 minutes um i think this is the the longest session i have in, in the diary this week um and meetings finish early if if you know you've achieved the outcome that was planned and it's you know pretty key that at the start of the, the meeting everyone's in line with what the agenda is and in terms of what they're trying to achieve um and as i mentioned that the zoom zoom camera is a, is a big one um so in terms of communication you know tools are just an enabler effectively right so it is all about process and um you know the whole culture in general but there are tools that kind of make this um, a lot easier for us to communicate and collaborate as, as a team. 
Now I've spoken a, a good bit about Notion and that being our, our brain. Um, obviously Zoom everyone's familiar with and unlikely Slack. Um, but in terms of collaboration, I got asked a question recently is, you know, how do you collaborate um, and brainstorm in a remote environment? Because it's, it's very difficult to kind of simulate, you know, a, a, you know, a whiteboard session or a brainstorming session in, in a room where everybody's around together. So there is a, a tool that we've been using for the last number of years. I'm going to maybe give a sneak peek on, on how we use it, which is called Miro. Uh, or real-time boards, and for those who are not familiar with it, but it's really, really useful for us to kind of, when we're doing anything, maybe on the creative side of things, it kind of simulates this this whole whiteboard. So we could have our designers or our product team or our engineers collaborate and you use post-it notes here. And if there's people on, you can see, you know, where their cursor is. So it's very good, you know, this and, and Zoom works quite well together. So once we're having those kind of brainstorming sessions, um, you know, there's, there's mock-ups here of designs of this is a particular feature. Um, you can see the iterations of, of designs, um, but that that is pretty key and fundamental to um, to how we work and collaborate as, as a team. Um, I I might pause there for for any questions, and um, just around communication. So please do post uh, questions there in the Q&A box that we can take them. Finn, um, two things occurred to me. One is that I've heard so much about Notion, but I've never seen it. So if you could go into it, that'd be great. Uh, but, but no worries sure. if you can't. And, and my second question in the, in the wrong order would be, um, you know, when you say you notice that thing about there's nine in the office, there's one outside it. And I think so many people have felt the pain of that, particularly if you've been working in companies who are hybrid and not yeah. kind of purposely remote. How did you find out that that was an issue? Did you survey or, or did they come to you? Or I suppose when people lack context, they don't know what they don't know. So they mightn't always be able to make management aware that there's an issue. So just how did you know that was a problem? Well, well it was two, like to the first point, we, we run a survey every week um, in terms of getting feedback. It's anonymous for, for the team so they can give feedback on how we can improve. Um, the second was, you know, people had, clearly not heard particular things or should have had context on something it was mm. oh they missed this meeting oh that was just you know that was a Dublin only meeting we forgot to include the, the zoom link and we didn't you know we didn't bother then after so it was kind of you know learning the hard way that they didn't have full context on on particular things um yeah, yeah. so back to your, your first question notion um this is this is notion here so you know it's, it it is just a wiki but this is where we have all our policies and procedures, particularly, on, and I'm going to talk a little bit about onboarding, you know, the way we work, um, you know, this really helps with people getting up to speed, you know, day to day, you know, well, how we run meetings, where to document things, actions, there's, you know, key projects, and then some more learning around, you know, particular um, deep dive. So it is, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, it is and it's super easy to yeah. you know to set up. It's you know, everything lives in there. This is as I said, this is our, our brain. So um yeah, it's an awesome product. That's really um great to know, Finn. I've heard so much about it, but now I can see why the hype is there. Um Alan Julie asks, do you um and hello hello Alan, um do you use pen mouses for whiteboarding as in drawing? Yes. So I um within Miro you can you can kind of collaborate and, and show, you know, you can do markup on particular things. So I know when the designers are working with product and engineering, um, you know, they, they have the, you know, there is a, let's see if I can bring it up now, but there is an option there where you can, you can mark things as well on the fly. Great. Um, hello, Portner Shed, Herb Sim with Mary. Uh, Mary asks about, can you confirm the name of the weekly check-in tool? Is it Lattice or Lattice? And then Anne Lattice. asks, yeah. Lattice. And yeah. then um, Anne asks, can int also interested in seeing a, glan a glance at Lattice. I'm not sure if that actually brings us into your company information, if you yeah, show us that. I, 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 yeah, I have it open here in the tab. I just realized then there's some, there's some sense of goals on this one. But yeah, uh, because we use Lattice for, for two things, right? L Lattice is around our OKRs, yeah. um, which it has our product goals. I'm going to talk a little bit more on, on performance management. Uh, so it has you know, the company objectives and those key results. Uh, but then it also has the, the ability to have the, the weekly updates as well. Um, and you can get, you know, 360 feedback. Um, it's a product we haven't been using for, you know, so oh, we've only been using it for about a month or so. Um, we did use kind of two or three other tools for doing the same thing, but it seems to kind of track our goals um, on a week to week, which is pretty important in, in the remote world to make sure that everyone is aligned to that they're working on the right things. Super. Um, 
I think separately we might go and go remote, go and get kind of a demo of Lotus from them, maybe Latif, sorry, um, to see, because I think it, it is a really interesting tool. And if we could educate more of our, our users about that, that might be great. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie Cook says that, uh, no question, but just to back up that uh, experience in video call is so much more effective than audio. I think I'd agree. You can see um, yeah. mannerisms and things like that. Um, there's two more questions. I'm, um, uh, Gillian, how do you manage stand-up meetings remotely? But we just covered that. Um, and Anne Callan says, hi, Lo Anne. Um, any interested in what tool you use for surveys? Is that Latisse as well? Yeah, la Latisse, I, I, Latisse, you're probably pronouncing it the right yeah. way. I'm, I'm probably saying the wrong thing. Um, but that, that does the surveys as well. Um, we did use another tool that we just, uh, before Lattice, uh let me get i'll get the name before the the end of, of the presentation but it was Super. um pretty good yeah brilliant okay continue on and uh post away in the questions there and we'll we'll take them after the next section so yeah just one thing just on on uh, i want to go through is just on the onboarding piece so obviously you know onboarding is is key to co-located and and uh, remote but um for us we you know we did learn you know, that the folks that were joining remotely weren't, you know, that we weren't getting enough value or they weren't giving value to customers as, as quickly as we'd like. Um, and that's down to a number of things. So one of the basics obviously is getting the, the right environment set up. Um, so it's, you know, tools are one thing, but it's just, you know, getting them the right hardware, headset, screens, uh, so they can do their job uh, effectively. Um, you'd be amazed on, and uh, particularly now in that shift that we had co-located people moving remote, um, we had to kind of scramble around and, and get, um, you know, the right headsets and, and screens out to, out to people over the last number of weeks. Um, you know, we use a buddy system. So this is someone outside, you know, their, their close team in a different part of the, the business that is there for them that is, um, can answer obviously any questions. Um, as I mentioned, the ways of working and, and, and the company handbook and all that information I shared on the screen lives in, in Notion. So that's pretty key to the onboarding phase. Um, making it crystal clear on, on the expectations of that role and, and making it clear for the rest of the team of what their remit is well, as well. Um, training is obviously a given that we're obviously a product company. Um, so it's, it's pretty, um, pretty key that our, our people are up to, up to speed on, on the product uh, from the outset. And then just, you know, arranging opportunities to get feedback early and often throughout the process. But an inter interesting one is this last point is, and it may sound like a, a contradiction, is that the way we onboarded people in the hybrid way pre-COVID was that we would bring people in for a week or so. So if I, you know, if there's a new joiner coming from, you know, Madrid or Donegal, we we bring them into the office in, into Dublin, put them up in Airbnb for for a week, and uh, and got them up to up to speed as part of the induction. And now we don't have that luxury right now. Um, but yeah, that's that's something we did, and and unlikely continue to do when when going forward. Um, and the reason why is probably just more on the, you know, there's a social element as well potentially that, you know, they could go up to the team for on a beer that first week, um, they could meet the leadership team face to face. So there's some there's some benefits. I know it may sound like a, a contradiction for this presentation, but um, that's just the way we we onboarded folks. Um, so yeah, per performance management, and we touched on, on some of this previously. So you know, one thing we, we have done in, in more recently in the last number of weeks is, is hold more frequent one-to-ones. Um, I think the challenge is in particularly people that haven't you know, worked in a remote environment before is you know, the boundaries are, are a little bit blurred in terms of you know, where, the work, where work ends and, and starts. It's difficult to, depending on the environment. Um, so yeah, people, there is that more risk of, of isolation and, and loneliness. So we do tend to, to check in a lot more regularly with, with people that are remote as well. Um, you know, so we, we, you know, we, we encourage them to have, you know, one or two, at least one, if not two or three um, one-to-ones throughout the week. And that, you know, a key fundamental part really of, of how we run our business anyway, is that we don't, it's not about, you know, visibility on, how many activities they've done or how often, you know, I don't see them online on Slack. Why are they not responding to my, my messaging, you know, within five minutes, you know, they must be in the garden, not working. So for us, it's, it's really about focusing on, on outcomes and results 
And that goes back to how we make that clear in the framework that we use uh, and use it, you know, objectives and key results or OKRs. Um, so this is just a framework to ensure that we have that alignment and transparency and focus and collaboration across the team. So that is what we use LATIS or if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, it, it gives us the you know ability that we have, and I'm, let me show on our, our next screen, um, you know, this bit more detail on this framework. So we have the company OKRs. So these were the, you know, two or three high level objectives, um, more qualitative, and then underneath then there's the, the measures of the key results. Um, we've got the department ones that will cascade then down to the individual. So every single person that joins new or existing uh, is, you know, should be crystal clear on you know, what they're, they're being measured on, right? So they have you know, two or three goals or objectives for, for the quarter and, and a number of key results. So again, it's, you know, you're not, you're not, we're not measuring people on the number of hours worked per day. It's very much in, in the data on, on these uh, key results. So yeah, I think this is more so obviously in the remote world. Um, you know, there's maybe a tendency to, you know, to get a little bit more distracted or not know why you're, you're working on something. So that it, it does keep us a little bit more focused and, and aligned. Um, and having that framework has, has made a difference. Now we've, we've been using OKRs for a number of years, but this tool, again, I keep talking about tools, it's, it's not, it's more of an enabler, but this has made things a lot easier to, to track. And, and on a weekly basis, then we, we, you know, update those key results and make sure people are, are aligned to those. Um, and the beauty about this OKR framework is it's very much agile in that we can, you know, you, you revisit these objectives every quarter. So given the way and nature things are changing right now, it's, it's good to um, refresh the, the outlook for the business every, every quarter. Um, so yeah, some, I'll just do a quick recap on, on some of these key lessons. So look, I think for us, we're, we're moving towards a conclusion that if we, you know, going hybrid um, or fully remote, you have to kind of commit. Um, so it, it, you know, we've, we've been doing this for years. It doesn't, we're not experts by any means. You know, we, we try and keep up to, to date with what the best remote companies doing and the best hybrid companies are doing. Um, but this is something definitely a learning on our side that we've had to make adjustments on the way we work uh, and going, you know, going with that remote first culture has made a, a fundamental difference. Um, and even, you know, to be honest, even in the last few weeks, the fact that everyone's gone fully remote, things have gone, um, things are being even more productive than ever. I've spoken about over communication has, has been a, a pretty key one. Um, mentioned about the training as well. You know, investing in onboarding for for new joiners can be a little bit challenging as well for junior folks that are you know new to the business um, and may not have worked in a remote world. So that you know we're we're spending a lot more time in, on that and getting those folks up to speed. Um, and underpins everything is trust. So it's just assuming positive intent. Um, from the team and as I mentioned that this is you know you know we're, we're on a journey here so this is we're learning every day in terms of, of, of how we can improve as a team uh, you know so it's we, we have we have that survey that goes every week we take feedback on how we can improve you know increase the cadence on particular communication people are still not hearing like we're by no means perfect so we're, we're obviously taking taking baby steps along the way um, and, and listen to feedback on, on how we can improve every day. Um, so the interesting thing is where we are right now in terms of our journey in that, you know, we ran a survey about two weeks ago to the whole business and asked them, you know, 100 questions on, you know, do you have the right kit working remotely right now? And particularly on the people that have just have been based in, in one of our hopes. Um, and 80% of people came back and said, you know, post COVID, they would prefer to go all remote. So we're at that interesting junction now where as a business, we're considering um, going all remote and potentially, you know, reducing the complexity of having eight different offices and the span of control and um, cost is one driver, but it's, it's, it's really around the feedback we were getting from the team and that they're a lot happier. They feel that they're more productive. They don't have the longer commutes. So we're, you know, we're going to make a decision probably over the next month uh, or so with the team to decide on next steps. And probably, I, I think the way things are going, 
Um, obviously, more companies are, are going to go down the more hybrid route initially. But I think what we'll likely do is, I think the model we have with the kind of mini hubs where we have hot desks kind of works quite well. And the feedback some people send, yeah, I like remote, but I do like to maybe come to the office one day a week. So rather than that shift previously where people might do the odd Friday from home, I, th I think going forward, we'll, we may get a couple of hot desks in particular areas. It's not going to suit everyone, but um, where people could come in one day a week. Um, but it's still, I haven't made that decision, but it's interesting to see that, you know, one, even since the co-located people are, have gone remote, that they're, they're really enjoying the experience too. So yeah, uh, that's, that's basically it. So I can, I can go deeper in any area. That's um, amazing. It's so comprehensive. Um, Finn, it's probably one of the most kind of practical presentations that we've had. So that's really useful. And um, Karen just says a, dam a demo on Latisse uh, will be great. Um, so yes, absolutely. We'll do that. Um, Karen uh, runs a really brilliant um, flexible recruitment agency, Finn, but she just says now, any, any tips for onboarding remotely for the first time? Uh, for example, tips or questions to identify someone who is right for remote working. Um, and I think this is interesting from lots of perspectives, including we launched a training course with the IDA and Department of Business and a few others, and they've just started this week. And I suppose from even from me thinking about them, how do we make sure that they're saying the right things to you to, to get employed? Yeah, it, it depends. Like, are these folks that haven't worked remotely before, is it? Or well, I suppose maybe Karen's question was was more generally, but I suppose but just when when you're when you're hiring, like, what are the interview questions you ask to see are you going to be okay working remotely? On the training course, a lot of people haven't worked yeah. remotely before yet. And and. I can, I can give a little bit on, on our journey. So initially when we started off within the engineering team, um, we kind of, we made sure that we, the people that we hired, and this was a little bit restrictive that had experience working remotely before is because it was new to us. We said, okay, and we, we put the roles out and then we said, these are remote roles, but we were looking for people that have worked remotely before because it is, it is a big shift. Now we, we totally flipped that in the last couple of years in that, you know, we've taken on people that haven't worked in, in the remote um, environment before. So we do, you know, we do have a set of, you know, questions that we have and we measure up to the, the right fit for the role. Um, but a big part of our recruitment process is the referrals and making sure that we get the right references as well. So we may be able to and have gauge whether, you know, people are, uh, are going to be able to, to work in a remote environment. So there might be things like, you know, if you're, there might be a new manager role um, and if we're doing background checks on a particular individual and if we find out that their style is you know they're a micromanager that transition from a micromanager into a, into a remote world is you know those those kind of traits are going to be amplified in, in the remote world so it is a lot more challenging to to run a team and not see your you know your team members and what they're working on and, and making sure they're working nine to five or nine to six whatever the, their hours are so we can kind of get that in the and then it's going to be more on the um the reference that what it you know what is their style that probably makes a difference to whether we think they're capable to make that shift um straight away yeah and even if they understand that there is a shift to make or, or they know enough about the remote world to know it's a little bit different it might be useful and um, yeah. eddie says um just wondering how you ma how you manage product launch as a SaaS company um, and taking into consideration remote teams yeah, so on, on the product side, in terms of the, the launch, like all of our customers are, the majority of our customers are, are not in, like all our customers in the US effectively, the customers in 50 different countries. So um, you know, from the, from the get-go, when we're doing customer interviews, it's all remote anyway. So we've had to, be, you know, we, there are cases where we go and meet enterprise clients, but for the majority of cases, any of the customer research or product research that we're doing, um, it's all remote. So, you know, it's, it's, it's Zoom calls, doing that research, doing that validation. And then on the launch piece then as well, we, you know, we, we do a lot of launches within the product, use tools like Intercom, um, you know, we do webinars we're running right now for, for any, any product launches as well. So, um, and that's, our hand has been forced that way because obviously we're uh, a product company across, you know, 50 different markets are already. So it's been, um, you know, it's, it's using the, the likes of, of Intercom and, and other tools to get the message out there. We do email blasts as well um, to, to give you know clients updates on on particular releases or, or things that are coming down the line. 
Brilliant. Um, Tatiana actually has a question that I have too. So I hear from people who went remote now that they find the creative collaboration to be the most challenging, that they are missing the water cooler conversations and that prompt some creative sparks or just coming to a colleague to chat to, an to exchange an idea. What is your experience and approach to these processes? I suppose, Finn, the, the, the piece yeah. around meetings, I think, is so interesting that everybody joins in on Zoom and there's equal you know, ability to participate. But outside of meetings, then you just have meeting up and, and those water coolers. So, yeah, yeah. it's a good question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. So, you know, there are, you know, there's plugins in, in Slack that we use, the donut chats, for instance, right, which randomly selects people um, throughout the business. Um, and that's more of a social thing to, to get to know other people that you wouldn't have, you know, you would bump into in the canteen or, or have those water cooler chats with. Um, so that, you know, that, that helps on the, the social element, but to have, you know, to have that, you know, creative discussion with someone at the start of the meeting, we, we, people, people might they'd have the one-to-one -one and they'd say, let's jump on a quick Zoom and have a chat. So we do have, there is a form that people have informal discussions anyway. So it isn't a case of, okay, I need to join Zoom. Oh, you know, everybody else is here. I, I can't get into this. I have an idea. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm I don't really want to say this right now. Um, people tend to do it on a one-to-one -one with you know that designer in, in and it's a pretty open environment anyway that um and i know it's it's very hard to you know replace those water cooler chats um but yeah we we try and pair people up and with with, with the likes of donut chats to get to know each other and then um yeah there's going to be regular one-to-ones between design and the product team and the engineering team just so they can kind of brainstorm as well yeah, that's brilliant. I think Donut comes up in an awful lot of um, talks. So Donut is a plug-in for Slack where they just randomly uh, put you in with somebody else. Some people, some people hate it, some people love it. Um, but it's definitely um, brilliant for, for that. Um, in general, Finn, there's, a, there's talk now because obviously there's a lot of hyper and remote at the moment and there's talk about, well, it's not, it's, you know, real concerns around the well-being and the mental health of, of our workers if we all go remote. Um, my instant response to that because I'm too for too biased down one particular rabbit hole is the two hour commute wasn't so great for our mental health either. Um, but there are serious concerns concerns around it. Do you do you do anything to kind of solve for that side of it? Yeah, so you know we have you know particular wellness committees um, that look after to that. As as I said, we have those anonymous surveys and we have the one to ones with the managers more more frequently now as well. Um, we do there's a couple of initiatives that we do every second day five o'clock there's a, a company-wide mindfulness um where everyone jumps on onto headspace and, and gets some mindfulness and then that we've got super positive feedback on that so that's that's made a, a difference so you know I, I know wow particularly now that um you know people are feeling a lot more isolated and, and particularly people that haven't worked like this before and that's why those regular one-to-ones um, and it's not you know it's not a check-in on, on work you know, half of the purpose of those is really just on a personal level to make sure people are, you know, they're getting the support they need. Um, and, you know, they're, and we have to, you have to show, you know, empathize with the people that there's a lot going on right now, you know, you know, childcare scenarios might be there. It's, you know, the environment is, is pre pretty tricky. So you have to give a lot more flexibility, right? So it's not a case of, you know, where I've, the amount of meetings we've had in the last number of weeks where people are bringing their kids to the session, it's, you know, we have to allow people to say, no, I can't, you know, I, you know, I need to take out three hours in the middle of the day now, just, I don't have childcare. So you have to kind of work around people's, people's scenarios right now. Um, so that's giving people a lot more flexibility is, is one of those, but the likes of, of running those, those wellness initiatives, like the, the mindfulness every, every couple of days, um, you know, we have got a lot of positive feedback on that. I, I would uh, hope so. That is amazing. It's the first time I've heard it's kind of something like that, where the company gets together to, to do something. I think that's superb. It's a really practical way. Um, Anne says, out of interest, is there a specific role in your organization that has responsibility to coordinate people, uh, people interaction? A glue person. And she says she loves the mindfulness. Um, Finn HubSpot, um, it just in the last six months, um, mm. advertised and hired for an inclusion manager for remote workers. Um, and that was the yeah. first role that I saw like that. And I thought it was a really interesting um, way to approach remote um, to, to ensure that everybody's included because obviously they're hybrid. So yeah. is there somebody who's a glue, a glue or a person? Yes, yeah, it's kind of kind of split between, um, well, it'll be Oliver on our, on our, 
operations team who also looks after people as well. Mm. So he, you know, part of his, his remit. Now we don't have, and I forget what the, the, the new role out there is now on, on this, but that I know that glue is a, is it going to be a particular role now going forward and particularly large companies I, for us we don't need don't necessarily need a full-time person that's going to be that enabler it's going to be very much part of the you know the people team's role and the ops team's role to make sure that um we are communicating we have the right tools we have the right environment so it's, it's and, and we're running these wellness initiatives so at the moment it, it sits with the people and the and the ops team um but yeah i, I can see the the way things are shifting, this could be, you know, a dedicated person, you know, once we get up to a scale where, um, where someone is that glue between the, the rest of the business. So, I mean, and to be honest, even the people roles today is slightly evolved in that they are taking on that mantle to be, you know, to make sure that, the, the you know, as, as you meant, make sure that people's wellness is, is right now um, and having, you know, HR and people teams are, are, are reaching out to people based on these surveys, right? Because we, we run these anonymous surveys, but there is a, an opportunity for the people team who only have access to this to get back to people on their concerns. Um, I didn't realize that was anonymous. So that's brilliant because obviously you can do that. And um, just as you're speaking there, but embedding it in the culture and um, something that I'm hearing in large organizations is say they're making that initial shift that you did from office first to remote first culture. Did you m ever map out kind of the behaviors that you need to see change, like from meeting charters to something else to something else? You know, kind of all the different things that being remote first means as opposed to being office first means. Yeah, so we we you know, within, I could probably dig it out here in Ocean Summer, but we did kind of document, you know, this is, these are the kind of ground rules, these are the expectations, and, and this is kind of the, kind of the plan to get there. Um, so yeah, we, we did sit down as a company and, um, you know, because we had to explicitly make that decision, like, you know, are we going to continue with remote? Because at the moment we're, we're, we're hitting a lot of roadblocks here where there's miscommunication, people are not aligned, um, and we could see the benefits, but it was just, whether we it might just be easier to get everyone in the room. What what are we going to do? So that that honestly that that came up, but it was like no, you know, we're we're bought into this, and we know, you know, that we know this is going to work. Um, but we have to, as you said, get a plan together of like, okay, how do we do that? Because it's not just a case of, oh, everybody turn on your Zoom. That's our shift to remote, right? It's like there's, that's you know, I'm just giving a couple of examples, but there's yeah, yeah. there's the fundamentals of how we work have to change, right? Yeah. And that that culture thing is, you know, it's it's more than just a couple of policies out there and communicate with people it's you know it takes training it takes um you know comms on on how we work and then, um yeah it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight and we're not to be honest we're not there yet um we're we're improving um every day with um as much as we can yeah i know you said you're not an expert but i think all the real experts say they're not experts and that they're always learning so um yeah, I think you've obviously got a lot of experience. Um, just a question. So it came up on another webinar around home offices. So the exact question was, um, and it was in for companies again, and they said, so if you pay for a chair for somebody's home office and somebody breaks their leg off the chair, can they sue you? Because that's essentially, and like the answer was like, no, like, you know, and people are so concerned about things like that. But I'm just wondering, did you run into any roadblocks or how did you, did you support people kind of setting up offices or going into court and spaces or things like that? Or did you do it at all? Yeah, so you know, as I mentioned in the the onboarding piece, that I think a big part of it is making sure people have the right kit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, before they join, like, and it's even small things of having their laptop ready the day they start. You know, we've had examples where people didn't have a laptop on day one, and it's just, it's just, it doesn't set the right tone, right? Yeah. So you need to. I don't know the stats, but I saw um, saw a pretty surprising one recently. You know, with that onboarding experience is is pretty key. So being able to support them with, you know, having a number of screens and you know, we don't do it we probably should and, and we've talked about it before about having the ergonomic assessments and making sure people have the chairs at the right level there have been requests where people are obviously looking for stand-up desks so there is a, a budget allocated to, to people to get the right kit um because you know once they're they have the right environment then obviously they're going to be working a lot more effectively so yeah. um we just it, we've done it by giving people the, the choice to to work what's best for them we recommend you know this is xyz headset and then they have a budget to if there's something else that they they want to use and that's that's up to them yeah um, 
Um, I think that capsule, like upfront cost and getting people set up right, pays off. Um, but I also think in in in, in lots of other th other talks that we're hearing, there's you know stuff the company has to do. But there's also a lot of personal responsibility. So just making sure that that people themselves take the take the responsibility for it. And um, if there's no other questions, um, I'm going to um, close it out. But then I'm going to take loads of snippets of all of this uh, to share it because it's. Just immensely useful and maybe if you'll give me your slides too I'll, I'll share those but um congratulations on the raise uh and well done and we wish glow fox i suppose all the best and again um we are a volunteer group but we do not take the time for granted so thanks a million while you're super busy for taking time out of your day hopefully it'll help no, us no, no, drive thanks, more thanks remote me. yeah no I'm, I'm super passionate about remote working so um thanks thanks for the time i think it the thing for me is like you can see now, and even I think even like so yesterday, Twitter have, have yeah. gone fully remote and said, "Listen, mm -hmm. you don't have to come back to the office." And, and in a way, it must be frustrating for for you in that you've been banging the drum about remote working for years, and now it's like you can hear companies going, "Oh, actually, you have to see it to believe it." So I do think you know the future of work is is now, right? It's it's going to shift, and um, you know people are going to whether they go back all remote, make that decision like Twitter, or go back hybrid, or even be at the very least more flexible right because that's what people want right so choice um choice and yeah. i think yeah and when you're talking about their fan about talking about you know you know you had it you was challenging and would you believed and i think if we can get people to believe fundamentally that okay you know it's, it is hard it's not you know the nirvana immediately however if we can get them just to kind of take that take remote as a goal and move towards it then we're then we're flying it um but um, yeah, it's, it's it's strange time to go remote because we did raise, but we haven't drawn it down because government funding evidently takes a lot of time. So we're, we're kind of in that phase where, you know, just a lot of things are happening at once. But I think what's going to happen is hybrid are going to go fully remote and people yeah. who aren't remote at all are going to go hybrid. And that's yeah. at least pushing an, up, everybody up a notch, another, another whatever step on the ladder. And then we'll have employment everywhere and the world will be put to rights. <laughs> and we'll be grand. Yeah, we'll all be living on Apple Island. <laughs> oh yeah, or Armour Island, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, Finn, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Talk to you if later. If you have any other questions, uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn if anyone wants to. I've actually got loads for you afterwards, so, but I'll, I'll LinkedIn them to you. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Talk to you Bye. later.